uh, all, we are turning now to session three. Um, the topic here is, is defined as cyber, cybersecurity elsewhere. We've, we've certainly touched on, um, on the set of issues that we're going to look at in greater depth uh, already. This, we're going to do this in, in a sort of a two-tier discussion. Um, first, we're going to get three national perspectives uh, on the whole set of issues that we've talked about. Um, how these uh, issues and um, state of play is seen in three different, three very different countries. Uh, and then we're going to turn to a greater exploration of where things stand in the multilateral system and, uh, and, and what, the, what the challenges um, uh, are ahead. You have full bios in your books, so I won't, um, I, I won't repeat them. On my immediate right, Preetam Malur, who is from the ITU, from the Corporate Strategy and Policy um, Division. Uh, Ido Moed from the Foreign Ministry in Israel, who is responsible for cyber issues. Uh, Diego Molano, the former ICT Minister of Colombia, uh, also very active, um, a long career in the private sector as well as in government and in, uh, in the multilateral sphere. And Mikito Shimokawa uh, from Japan, also from the Foreign Ministry, looking uh, responsible for for these issues. So, you know, why don't we start with you? Tell us um, how Israel is coping with these problems, sees the issues, mm -hmm. um, and give us a, a glimpse. Thanks. All right. Uh, good morning. It's great to be here. Um, from Israeli perspective, cyber uh, cybersecurity basically it has evolved in an atmosphere where security and national security concerns have always been on the top level of attention of the leaders. So uh, as opposed to many countries where cybersecurity all of a sudden is also part of the realization that there is a national security threat by itself and adding to that the technolog technological aspect, I think that in Israel we've been uh, mitigating uh, the issues of cyber as what are the different and the <coughs> special attributes in terms of national security. And so therefore in a sort of an evolving process that started in 1997, uh, we've set up uh, a national entity under the Prime Minister's office that uh, devises the policies and being part of the Prime Minister's office has access to the, all, all the national organs that are relevant. And so um, beyond the security aspect, there's also another very important aspect that is unique to Israel, I think, and that is the fact that Israel's economy is very much dependent on high-tech industry. And so it is, uh, from a national perspective, also very much important to strengthen and to encourage that kind, that industry in cyber to contribute to the national uh, growth. So uh, a national, ha national approach has these two tenants, two pillars, let's say, uh, and I think that is uh, the most important aspect of where we are coming from when we are talking about the global discussion. Rabbi Diego. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, thank you. Let, let me, I, I, I didn't know where to start, but I'm gonna start with all you guys. Could you please pull out all your cell phones? Everybody has a, a mobile phone. If you have it, please do it as well, please do it. Turn them on. They're supposed to turn them off. <laughs> uh, turn it on, and please unlock them. Everybody has their phone, please raise, raise it. Unlock them and give it to the person next to you. <laughs> <laughs> who's, willing to, who's willing to do it? Who's willing to do it? <laughs> How do you feel? How do you feel? Scared? Well, mine is in Hebrew, so I'm not, I'm not concerned. Are you concerned? <laughs> it's Hebrew. I, I can translate it very easy. Google translation translates everything very, very easy. Uh, <clears throat> this is what you know, I, I don't mean that I'm talk, going to talk about Latin America. That doesn't mean that Latin Americans do this. <laughs> but you guys, you are a leading community on cybersecurity. You know what it is at stake when you ch do that. But you are doing that every day in the cyberspace, every day. Most people don't read the contracts. 
most people do not take care of their own cybersecurity. And most importantly, most people are not aware of their risks. And that's the main issue of Latin America. When you see the poll, and, and you're going to see uh, 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 in a few weeks a, a report published by the Organization of American States and the Inter-American Bank on what it is happening in the region in terms of cybersecurity, the main issue we have is awareness. Awareness is basically the source of the solution. Because if you see, out of 34 countries in Latin America, just half of them have a clear e-government policy. And just four or five of them have a clear cybersecurity policy. Why is that? Because people and leaders are not aware of the risks. And it happened that, it, it happened in my country. You know, when, when, when I took office in 2010, part of the, of the plan was, of course, to have a clear cybersecurity uh, program. And it was a part of the whole plan called Vive Digital, Live Digital, which aimed to reduce poverty with technology. Of course, cybersecurity was part of that. And in 2010, we issued the, same, the first policy, but it, it was not as strong as I wanted. And then in, two, in, in 2014, I wanted to strengthen that. I wanted to issue a new version of that policy. Uh, but I couldn't convince my colleagues of the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Justice. And what happened? In, just the, in the presidential election campaign, somebody hacked President Santos' email. And then one of the opposition campaigns hacked the emails of the peace negotiation, uh, of the peace process negotiators in Cuba. That really took the issue high. And I was able to update my policy very, very easy. It was a very clear order by the president of Colombia. So what we have to work hard is increasing that awareness. So but can you tell us where you took the policy to? Uh, it, what, what we did was a, a, a comprehensive policy, you know, we, we got the help of the Organization of American States and many, many governments, the U.S. government, you know, Chris helped us a, a lot, the Israel government, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, many organizations. And we, what we did was, uh, of course, creating the right mechanisms to protect, uh, first of all, uh, first of all, uh, critical infrastructures, to create the institutional framework, uh, to create also the right co cooperation within the, go within the country, uh, not only within the government, but also within the country. That includes the private sector, not only the public sector. Uh, we also issued, uh, we changed completely the law. So cyber crime is punished now by the law. And we also work with the Justice Department to train judges, to create special judges on this and, and prosecutors of this, and, and a lot of incentives uh, in training people, training people, you know, creating new programs with universities. And uh, also, we created a program to increase, increase awareness. For example, in Colombia, every high school student has to do a social job. Social. So we created this program called um, uh, Net, uh, uh, revolutionaries in, in English would be like revolutionaries of the network. These kids go home by home. They knock at the door and they say, look at, do you use internet? So the, the, the family comes and says, no, ah, look at, this is the great things that you can do with internet. If they say, yes, we use internet, they say, let me tell you what the risks of internet are. Uh, of course, we train the community and in, in, the, in risks so, such as cyber sex, the grooming and the bullying and stuff like that, but also in cyber the, the, uh, crime and cyber protection. That's very, very important. So, so we really moved the country to, to train people. We created, for example, the, we transformed completely the education. We connect every single school to internet uh, and we delivered millions of tablets for free to public school students. That's worthless, unless 
you have a very clear strategy on how to use that. And we understood that working with teachers and students wasn't enough. So we created a whole school for parents. We call it the, the ICT school for parents. And we teach parents massively how to use technology and how to be aware of the risks of technology. Fascinating. Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, let me update you on the, uh, the uh, status quo of the uh, Japanese response to uh, cybersecurity issues. Uh, just this January, we have enacted the uh, basic act on uh, cybersecurity. This is not a regulatory framework which talks about liability of private or public companies, but uh, uh, this is a, a, a program which mandates the government to come up with a new uh, cybersecurity uh, uh, strategy which we have uh, promulgated and put in effect uh, just this September. And it was in this process of formulating the cybersecurity uh, uh, strategy that this uh, most recent and most serious incident on the uh, cyber attack on the Japan Pension Fund scheme in which the theft of 1.2 million uh, personal identifiable indication theft have been involved, uh, have occurred. So this was also, this gave us an opportunity to, uh, to sort of beef up the role of the, the, what we call the NISC, which is the National Center for Incident Preparedness and Strategy uh, in cyberspace. This is the, the, uh, the central organ that is now under uh, established as the secretariat for the headquarters for or cybersecurity uh, uh, headquarter uh, function, which is presided by the cabinet secretary. So we have actually now a basic act and a basic strategy and a very uh, centralized cabinet organization to sort of coordinate and formulate the strategies and also carry out assessment as far as the cybersecurity environment of the entire Japanese society is concerned, and which is also involved in the assessment of incident response and support, uh, providing support for investigation purposes. So this is uh, the general framework that we have newly put in place. And uh, as I refer shortly to the, the earlier discussions on information sharing and all of these things. This is still uh, under, uh, uh, transformation. Uh, we, are, we have many institutions which has been put in place uh, in different parts of the government in terms of uh, private-public partnership, for example, uh, exchange of information in different, uh, under different uh, ministries, ministries of communications, ministries of <coughs> e uh, economy and industry, under the context of cybercrime, uh, counter-cybercrime uh, cooperation. And also in the area of MOD, uh, MOD, uh, defense, self-defense uh, uh, cooperation. So we still have all those uh, different uh, layers uh, of uh, cooperation as far as information sharing is concerned. The uh, NISC uh, as a central function is now more or less uh, uh, expected to do a general coordination of what is in place as far as cybersecurity is concerned. And I, uh, uh, as being a diplomat in, in charge of uh, cybersecurity issues, is uh, uh, on the front line of uh, bilateral and trilateral and multilateral dialogues in terms of uh, uh, cybersecurity, both in terms of uh, rule making, uh, rule of law in cyberspace, capacity building, and confidence building. And this is in my this is in this is in this capacity, I. Uh, participating in many dialogues and uh, international conferences, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here present uh, today with you, uh, talking about uh, especially the diplomatic aspect of the cybersecurity. But I just wanted to update you on where we are on the great. cybersecurity. Is, yeah. I mean, for all three of you, is uh, thinking back on what you've heard and already know about the U.S. system this this morning. Are there aspects of your national system that you, other than what you've shared with us, that you think uh, that are different, that are better, that are that, that are worth kind of calling out as being a, quite a different way to to tackle this challenge? For me, um, I think the point is um, <coughs> that every country has a very different set of circumstances, so there is no good or bad. Every country is, is trying to mitigate the threats from its own circumstances, its own environment. 
So whatever happens in the U.S., of course, bears all over the world, has a bearing on all over the world because so much is concentrated <coughs> here, so much information and technology and knowledge and so on. But I think f for us, uh, we have a different set of uh, issues. And so, for example, we have a 1991, 1981 law of privacy on privacy, which actually resolves most of the issues that are being discussed <coughs> here in the States now. I don't think it's better, but it's different. It's just the fact that's the way we evolved in, this, in that particular area. Um, we have a law on the use of uh, uh, digital uh, media uh, that also dates to the 90s. So we, we use these, but probably there are a lot of loopholes and problems with those existing frameworks that we need to adjust. So other countries that are defining new laws or new frameworks actually have an, may have an advantage. Uh, in, the, in the case of Colombia, I think uh, <clears throat> one, one good thing that, that it is happening is, is the leadership of the government in terms of, uh, of especially the political side of the government, not the technical part. I mean, for the president, this issue is very important now. Uh, uh, and he himself uh, uh, leads uh, the Committee on Cyber Defense and Cyber Security. Um, and also, uh, you know, based on that leadership, we issued uh, a, a new set of uh, policies and legislation on e-government. For example, in, in Colombia, <clears throat> uh, according to, to, to the law, every single public agency has to have a CIO reporting to the head of, of the agency. And every single agency has to comply with the cybersecurity rules. It is mandatory. It, it is not optional at all. Just three countries in the region have that. Uh, and uh, also, the, the, the Ministry of ICT, uh, you know, defines mechanisms to help public agencies to comply with that, you know, the, in the procurement processes, uh, training people, stuff like that. So, so now it is for everybody in the in the Justice Department, in the Congress, and also in the administration, not only at the federal level, at the central level, but also in, in, in the different uh, states or departments and cities. So that's, that's very important. That's great. Well, I, I think as far as Japan is concerned, we share the uh, basic uh, principles, the, the basic uh, traditions of tre treating the issue that is public-private partnership, a whole of government approach, you know, multi uh, uh, stakeholder approach. So uh, it's generally uh, the same principle that we're working on. And the strategy talks not only about the security concerns, but also the, the positive aspect of a vibrant economy, uh, new areas for economic development, etc. cetera. Um, uh, if I may say, so, but maybe the, the, the question the, in relation to uh, the information sharing or the question of uh, encryption is not may not be as acute or as advanced as uh, in uh, the United States uh, uh, as far as the private-public partnership for information sharing is concerned. It's more or less on a, on a starting from a very voluntary approach uh, on a <coughs> consent basis. Uh, and uh, we've had some discussion about uh, scrubbing the uh, private uh, script on the personal information. But uh, we are also doing that. Uh, uh, on the basis of uh, uh, not uh, as a government competence, but uh, the uh, sort of uh, uh, agencies, uh, in information promotion agency, which uh, quasi-government organization cooperating with the related industries to, to work more or less on a voluntary basis for quick exchange and also seeking consent before circulating the information collected to the, the people's concern. So we are... We are building up uh, practices, and uh, we are doing this uh, uh, more or less uh, in an incremental ma manner. But uh, so maybe, uh, but but at the same time, we are facing the same kind of uh, urgency in terms of having to cope with uh, what is going on the, in the cyberspace. So we are more or less trying to 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 to, to sort of converge the. Uh, the incremental approach uh, against the, the, the very fast uh, uh, environment, uh, which is uh, with the increasing crisis. Thanks. Um, th when we began this morning, Richard alluded to me as somebody who 
had a misspent youth counting nuclear warheads. Um, the parts that were misspent, I can assure you, were a lot more fun than that. And I, and I didn't so much spend time counting warheads as thinking about creating regimes that work, um, not just in the nuclear area, but a lot of others as well. And I know that uh, for several of the panelists, the word regime is uncomfortable in this context. I mean by it the sum total of norms, agreements, binding agreements, treaties, and institutions um, that, th that operate in a particular area. Um, and it seems, although I may be corrected, that it's, it's the right word to describe where the world has to to eventually move in this area. Um, but we're, and, and so what I thought we'd do now is first hear um, about where the UN, uh, what it has achieved so far with the GG, where the GG is going, um, and then try to explore some of the issues that, that seem to me uh, um, particularly uh, challenging in this, in this area relative to all the international experience that we've had um, on, on dozens of other issues, particularly, I think, n nuclear proliferation, but climate, um, chlorofluorocarbon agreement, all kinds of, kinds of issues where some of these um, uh, problems have been tackled. But Preetam, why don't you start us off with a, with a review of what the GG has done so far and where it's going? Uh, OK. Thank you, and uh, first of all, thank you for inviting ITU uh, here. And Diego had his test of uh, the cell phone test of trust. So I have my uh, Microsoft Surface test of uh, trust, you know. I noticed I was the only guy since the morning who's using uh, this for my notes. Everyone else is relying on pen and paper. So uh, it could be for two reasons. One, uh, I'm the only engineer in the room, so I need props. I'm not naturally eloquent in a room full of uh, lawyers and diplomats. Or maybe somehow I intrinsically trust this device more than anyone else. But anyway, uh, it's always nice to be back in DC. You know, I studied here. I've spent uh, quite a big chunk of my life here. So I love this town. Uh, so the question that Dr. Matthews had uh, brings up a fundamental issue. You know, uh, My organization, the ITU, doesn't deal with the GGE. So, which is a broader issue, you know, uh, cybersecurity is obviously very complex, it's a multifaceted issue, and it's a global issue. And within the UN, the discussions are all over the place. You know, if you need to talk about uh, technical capacity building, standardization, then you come to the ITU in Geneva. Uh, that's my organization. Now, if you want to talk about cybercrime, then you go to the UNODC in Vienna. You want to talk about data protection, privacy, you go to UNESCO in Paris. And you come back to Geneva for human rights, the Human Rights Council. And then, of course, there's the uh, uh, UN General Assembly in New York, where there are three different committees, each of them talking about different aspects of uh, cybersecurity. Uh, uh, you have the VISIS overall review process, which is talking about norms. Then you have the UN uh, GG, the Governmental Group of Experts. Uh, which, which reports to the first committee, I think. And uh, I think all three countries here are part of the GG. And that's primarily the disarmament community talking about state-on-state uh, -state actions. And you have many different processes run, started by the private sector or by some states. Uh, you know, the London process, you have uh, the interparliamentary union, you have uh, think tanks uh, having their own processes, which are all excellent because what they do is they bring together like-minded people uh, you do awareness building, but ultimately there needs to be some kind of a coherence, uh, some kind of a cohesion to the whole dialogue. Uh, so, and, and that's, that's probably what is missing right now, bringing the discussions together. And this gives me a good segue to talk about my organization. The ITU, we, uh, the International Telecommunication Union, it's a 150-year-old organization. We started in 1865, this, so this is our 150th anniversary. And uh, we are primarily based in Geneva, primarily engineers. Uh, we work on uh, technical capacity building. We help uh, countries establish uh, uh, organizational structures. We do child online protection. We work on many, many different aspects. We do standardization. We have around uh, 300 uh, 
security standards. And if you look at our, uh, the history of our organization over 150 years, it essentially mirrors the history of technology. So uh, from, say, telegraph to telephone, from analog to digital, uh, from terrestrial broadcasting to satellites, analog uh, your mobile phone, uh, your regular landline to your mobile, and of course the internet era. And we are an organization primarily rooted in technology and we're very proud of that. Uh, maybe do I have uh, time to make one more point? Please. Okay, just, just as an observer uh, who's been through, I've uh, worked in ITU for 10 years, and it's quite interesting. Uh, ITU itself, uh, we've been dealing with cybersecurity over the past two decades. You know, our first resolution on cybersecurity, resolution is a UN document for uh, our countries agree to something. Our first resolution on cybersecurity was adopted in 2002, and uh, we've been working on the topic uh, long before that. The observation we have is, you know, the first decade we were primarily talking to our own members, which is the Ministry of Telecommunication, Ministry of uh, ICTs, but that's probably no longer true now. Uh, no, our delegation has completely evolved. You see the uh, uh, defense ministries, you have the finance ministries involved, you have the foreign ministries involved, health, education, and uh, this is the composition of uh, de national delegations which come to ITU. And not just that, you know, uh, even within the delegations, you don't just have the government folks. You have uh, uh, private sector, you have civil society, you have academia. And that's, this is a clear uh, demonstration of how the uh, debate has evolved from uh, being a purely government-led debate, purely among the technical guys, uh, now to essentially being a multi-stakeholder debate. So um, why don't we have a sort of a joint discussion from whoever would like to begin it on on the GG, where it stands, how how far it has moved. Chris Painter began his comments in the last panel by saying we've made tremendous progress, and I I um, it, that took me aback a bit because uh, uh, it's clear that governments are now recognizing the threat, uh, willing to engage and beginning to talk, but it can be an awfully long road between that place and actually solving a problem. Um, so who, who would like to kind of give us their sense of where the international conversation stands? Um, Peter, why don't you go ahead? I wouldn't mind having spent some time the last GG, long hours in a um, stop room with a very fascinating discussion that ended up in a report that is a culmination of global understanding where international law stands, how it should be applied in ICT environment. And um, in many ways, the success of this report is not, measured, not only measured by the fact that we reached the report, because this is the fourth session, fourth group, uh, but not every group has been able to come up with a, with a agreed report. Uh, so the fact that we have a report is a success, of course, but I think the success is being, can be measured now in the demand of so many countries to be part of this process in the future. So it seems to be like the best game in town to join if you want to sh be part of shaping norms and, in, and, and global understandings about cooperation in cyber. And this is so because all the players are there. There are a lot of regional organizations that do uh, very good work as well, like the OEC in Europe and the IRF in uh, Asia, and the Organization of American States and the African Union. But this is the only place, the only location where you have all the players sitting together around and discussing the same things. Having said all that, uh, the room was full with two groups of people, diplomats and legal people. And it's a very interesting discussion to see, or dynamic, to see how this develops uh, into some kind of a report. And so it was important for us to have a report, but we don't have a very clear end result, a result where we want to be. That varies according to the discussion. And what we lack, what we miss in the global discussion is also the technological aspect, which actually leads and, and stipulates uh, and guides most of the environment. And that's not the place in the United Nations, and perhaps uh, it's the ITU's role. But what I come to understand is that you have to have a multitude of players around the table if you really want to make uh, uh, an impact. 
what the GG report, I think the most important achievement is that we all understand that international law applies. So therefore, the word regime uh, may be um, overstated. We, we already agree how we work with each other, and that's international law, whether it's uh, international humanitarian law or uh, the United Nations Charter. But we already agreed on that a long time ago. We just have to see how that applies in cyber. So there's nothing new there, and I don't think uh, countries feel at the moment that we need some sort of a new regime. It's not the technology or the, the effects that cyber bears on international uh, relations and cooperation is indeed different, but that means that we have to have also other players around a table. And that means that we should have other discussions. So the ITU is working and all these other organizations, but we also found ourselves, find ourselves as diplomats talking to technicians and technical people from global organizations that want to understand how our government works with the industry and with the research environment because they also need some kind of guidance. And if we only focus on the GG, then we are missing some part of the picture which relates to others that are part of the game but are not affecting it through the existing international organization. So the basic point is, I think was mentioned earlier, we have to think out of the box here and be able to bring in others and to shape the discussion from different angles. Well, let, let me ask you and the others this question. Uh, one of the worst things you can do in an international, trying to develop an international agreement of some kind, set of agreements, regime, uh, is to focus entirely on norms and forget enforcement. Because then, then you simply empower the bad guys, uh, the countries that sign up without any intention of agreeing, and you completely undermine the integrity of the system. Um, are we anywhere with respect to the questions of enforcement, the bases for action in, in this regard in thinking about cybersecurity? Well, on this particular point, I think we had uh, this morning discussion about a whole set of tools for uh, having a right and uh, just and transparent uh, cyberspace. So I think uh, the work of the norm setting and uh, the identification of uh, applicable international law in what form and in which cases has to go in tandem with the other, other uh, actual tools on the, sp uh, on the, on the uh, spot uh, in, reality, in the real world as far as what the, the countries can do. And it works the other way around because if you have this common understanding at least to a certain level of what kind of international rules or norms apply, it gives you a ground for taking action uh, in, uh, in, in, whatever, in, in response to whatever happens in the cyberspace. This is why uh, I think in the previous discussion, uh, there was a discussion that uh, cyberspace is not uh, a lawless space where there's no law, so you can't do any, everything. It's not the complete wilderness. There is already a law that is applicable. So you have, to a certain extent, you know what you can legitimately do, lawfully do uh, in cyberspace. So that is what is important about this uh, norm setting. And that is why uh, we, Japan also, uh, with the like-minded countries, place importance on the applicability and the deepening of the discussion of the applicability of uh, existing international law in cyberspace. In the, in the case of, of Latin America, the Organization of American States and the Inter-American Bank have taken the lead on, on you know, taking the region to another level, trying to uh, encourage cooperation in all levels. But, uh, you know, I, I, I um, agree with the Edo uh, that the, 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 the issue, the legal issue, I think is, is okay. The thing is how to implement it in two ways. Speed in terms of the legal processes. They are very, very, very slow. I mean, not only for cyber, for everything, but in terms of cyber, we have to increase the, the speed of the legal procedures, the, that cooperation. But technically, we have a main bottleneck, a main bottleneck, because technically, countries in Latin America don't have the capabilities to define what they need to do. And, and sometimes, like the big banks, the World Bank and the uh, Inter-American uh, uh, Bank, come to these countries and they say, look at, this is the money to implement your cybersecurity policy and to, to create the, the tools needed to protect uh, your customers, your information, your country. Uh, but 
they don't know what to do with that money. So the, the help has to be really to take that innovation in cybersecurity, but in real tools. Countries cannot develop those tools themselves. That's key. It is, so, so the help we're having is just from the policy point of view. We have to move to real products, to real projects. The, um, you know, it's with some uh, international systems, like nuclear, for example, the system is only as safe as the, as the weakest link. So you can have a tiny little country like North <coughs> Korea um, uh, blow, uh, well, uh, threaten the entire system. Um, in others, you really only need to uh, work with the big actors. Climate, you know, there's seven political actors that account for 80 plus percent of the, of the emissions. Um, is this a system um, where we are, we will ultimately only be as safe as the weakest countries, the weakest links in the, in the international system? Jessica, you stole my closing line. I'm so sorry. anyway, <laughs> oh, so the you know we are as uh, strong as our weakest link is, is something which applies. Uh, maybe there will be new technologies where that may or may not hold true. You know, blockchain. There is an argument that uh, if if you strengthen some blockchains, then uh, probably you can protect the other ones. But anyway, that's a different story. Uh, you know, since today morning uh, in the various sessions. What I heard was, uh, let's work with let us work with this country or that country. Let's have bilateral agreements. Let's have a group of like-minded countries or a small set of stakeholders coming together. While that will help, uh, you have to remember that there are still four billion people who are still offline. You know, and when they come online, the opportunities, of course, are enormous, but the challenges will also be enormous. And your threats can come from anywhere, and that's something that we should not forget. So. Uh, an integral part of any country's uh, national cybersecurity strategy should also be to help others, uh, less developed countries, uh, kind of develop their own uh, capacity, uh, helping them set up uh, good institutional frameworks, organizational structures. Uh, you know, you shouldn't leave safe havens because that can be exploited. And you see that in the real world also. You know, uh, there are countries, uh, there are regions of the world that. Most people couldn't point on a map earlier. And now those are the uh, hotbits. Uh, and that could easily happen in the cyber domain also. So uh, essentially, you, sh you shouldn't be thinking of helping other countries as charity or uh, you know, altruistic uh, reasons. It's, that's the only way to protect yourself, sir. So that should be center and focus of any country's cybersecurity strategy, primarily the developed ones. And uh, international cooperation is key here. How are we going to get it? I mean, Siri, I, I didn't mean that facetiously, but isn't that a new, a, a completely new issue for, for the international community? It is, it is, and that's why you need more dialogue. I mean, that's why you need uh, to talk to everyone, not just countries who think like you or countries you have a financial interest in. Well, on this particular point, uh, as I said probably at the outset, uh, the. Uh, our outreach in the international community is, uh, have three pillars. That's uh, propaga propagation of rule of law in cyberspace and confidence building with uh, countries and also capacity building. And the capacity building is not doing for charity, as you say. This is for uh, strengthening the, uh, the weak spots in terms of cybersecurity uh, measures and policies are concerned. And this is not only for uh, transferring and the know-how, but this is also uh, against the backdrop of uh, the fact that there are different school of thought in terms of how you wish to regulate or how you wish to 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 to, to govern the internet uh, cyber uh, the, the cyberspace and uh, uh, and uh, as I said uh, in our strategy, we uh, we place great importance on such values as the freedom of expression, uh, democracy, transparency, openness, and uh, but uh, some models uh, in terms of cyberspace uh, governance is not necessarily based on the same value. They have a slightly different emphasis on uh, more control or more government involvement versus. Uh, uh, multi-layer facet uh, approach. So, so uh, this is not only about uh, 
sharing know-how, but this is also about uh, uh, how we want the world to be in terms of uh, the, the, the uh, if you don't want to use the re word regime, but what kind of uh, governance uh, is desirable for the uh, security of the uh, cyberspace. You know, uh, yeah, you I'd like to continue this point. I think it makes a lot of sense to connect this kind of activity, uh, outreach, cooperation, international cooperation to the norms question because uh, in many ways when you're talking about some kind of a new regime, that means that everybody more or less understands where we are at. And I don't think we are there. I think that many countries are far from it. Some countries don't have an interest. They don't have, they don't realize that they are part of a malicious uh, chain of events or they are not interested because they are just interested in getting to know what's needed, what's required of them, and they'll implement it. But actually, this is a new kind of a discussion and everybody has to be involved. And so from our perspective, as far as the norms go, we feel that norms should be, at this stage at least, uh, voluntary and non-binding, so everybody can join in, everybody can understand and learn uh, what it means, work a lot on, on uh, confidence building measures, which are very uh, focused actions that countries can take, and also work hard on capacity building, because that means that you're also learning while you are creating this kind of cooperation, either it's bilateral, multilateral, you're also learning how the perspective is from other countries. And as I said earlier, it, one country cannot understand the global situation. There are so many different circumstances. And just to point out a very good example that I think was mentioned earlier, the London process, uh, the Netherlands came up with a platform called Cybersecurity, Cyber Expertise, Global Cyber Expertise Forum. Yes which is um, a website, actually, where countries can uh, put their international cooperation programs with another country or other countries uh, and inform others of its existence and have them join it. So it's a sort of a pool of knowledge that's being created uh, where on, not only states, but multilateral, uh, multinational organizations and, and private companies can join in and take part in. And, and so that is being shared, and I think that's very, very important also in this respect. Yeah. Yeah. Diego, do you want to add on this? Uh, I think having everybody on the same table to discuss this is impossible, you know. But, but uh, and I think the dialogue, and I uh, agree with uh, Pritam, that we, we have to keep on talking. We have to move that talk also to real action to real action, to enforce action of, of many countries. And, and I see that in Latin America. Again, out of 35 countries, just five or six have a clear policy on this. But most of those countries, they have agreements, trade agreements with the US. They have trade agreements with Europe. But we are not, we have to, to really push them to move towards the right direction. Who's we? I mean, the whole community. I mean, the, the, in, in those, di that, those dialogues, I mean, it, this is not only about having the right recommendations to do. It's also really using all kind of tools available to, to say, look, at uh, you want to trade, do trade with me? You have to also increase your cybersecurity uh, uh, capabilities and, and, and policies to do trade with me, for example. So link it to trade agreements. Yeah. It's interesting. Did, go ahead. Oh, OK. So uh, uh, Diego mentioned uh, capacity building, and if you have the you know, uh, even if you have the money, what do you do? Uh, you know, there's one clear gap that I can point out. Uh, uh, most of you must have heard of uh, CERTs, Computer Incidents Response Teams, which are essentially, uh, if I put it simplistically, they're the first responders in case there's an attack, uh, national CERTs uh, in many countries. And you know, uh, out of 193 countries, 92 countries don't have a national CERT. So there's a clear gap. And that's an area where uh, my organization is focusing on, helping them establish a cert. And in some countries, you know, it's just a basic level of cert. Then you give them additional cap capabilities like forensics and all. So uh, we've done assessments in 65 countries. We helped establish certs in 15 countries. We are implementing four more. And even after you establish a cert, you need to make sure that it's functioning well, it's well embedded within the uh, regional community and also the global community. So we conduct these cyber drills uh, to make sure that uh, the coordination is happening well internally, externally. And we also tap into existing frameworks like uh, this first, which is an associ international association of certs. 
and we make sure once we help a country establish a cert, we also make sure that they can uh, tap into the existing uh, collaboration framework that FIRST uh, uh, offers. So that, that's a clear gap where the international community needs to do more. Let's talk for a minute about uh, the role of non-state actors in this. Um, it's hard enough to negotiate anything or agree on any enforceable agreements in, in a room of 200 governments. Um, uh, but where a major part of the threat are non-deterrable, non-state actors, how do, you, how do you even begin to proceed? Somebody pick up on this. I think it's problem. a very important question, uh, non-state actors. And we're talking about malign. So non-state actors, of course, could be private sector, but we're talking about groups and individuals that are abusing uh, networks to, to create harm. And that is a very uh, troubling aspect of, of cyber security. And how do you deal with that? that, not, that not, they are not members of any international organization or framework. So how do you deter them? Deter them? Uh, and there are two sides to it. One is, of course, was mentioned also earlier, is increasing cybersecurity uh, measures and uh, either nationally and internationally, but the other, on the other side, how do you work with the existing frameworks and how do you make sure that they are not part of, uh, of not continue what they're doing? So in this respect, there is the um, responsibility of states that give home to them, that uh, allow them to operate, but in many instances, those states are not even aware. And in some cases, it, there may be even a credible case that they are not aware of the existence of such groups that are operating from their territory. And how do they, should they monitor it? Do we have the tools for that? Um, so the issue of non-state actors is one, I think one of the biggest challenges that needs to be addressed in the international arena. And uh, especially when it comes to terrorists and terrorist use of, of, of networks, either it's attacks or the use of the networks for recruitment or whatever, this is one of the biggest challenges that we have to address. Anyone want to add on that? Well, I quite agree. I mean, this is uh, something, a very difficult issue, and we would probably have to, to cope, uh, counter those uh, attacks on, based on a different arena. I mean, <coughs> if, if it falls in the ambit of uh, a cyber crime, I think uh, the uh, reinforcement of uh, information cooperation and also uh, cooperation, international cooperation between the law, law enforcement to, uh, agencies would be the uh, the most effective uh, action to take uh, against such kind of uh, cyber issues. And if it goes more to the direction which involves national security, of course, that would involve uh, cooperation with uh, allied countries in terms of how you address uh, such attacks, especially on uh, critical infrastructure or real-time exchange of information on concrete incidents. And this is the kind of issue that uh, we would like to, uh, to, to promote uh, cooperation on with uh, allies, uh, starting with the United States. Let's turn to the, to the room. Um, who would like to begin, please? And the same rules apply. Remember, we're on the record. And we'd like to know who you are and, uh, and to please wait for the mic. Right here. Thank you. Uh, Mika Kertuna, Cyber Policy Institute, Estonia. I have a question about uh, Israeli uh, cyber policy. So uh, as Israel is uh, one of the, let's say, most powerful countries in cyber field that has not published a cyber strategy, uh, most of the countries haven't, uh, but Israel perhaps being the good exemption in that, that, that uh, list of countries. How does the Prime Minister's office engage the nation and engage the private sector without a published uh, strategy? And, and, uh, and a follow on that, uh, as we cannot read what is the Israeli development in the field, could you elaborate what are the needs to adjust in Israeli uh, cyber policy, what kind of uh, measures uh, are next online to up, update or upgrade your, your policy and therefore your capacity? Thank you. Um, 
It's a very good question. And we've been asked that uh, more, quite often. As I said at the outset, I think the need to have a, a clearly formulated cyber strategy, as we've seen around the world, uh, doesn't exist in Israel because we, our strategy is very clear. In our environment, uh, we are attacked basically on, because we are there. We are in the way of some people, probably. And so it's very clear that what we are doing has a very clear sense that to protect ourselves. Um, but there, is no, there are no secrets here. So uh, for example, as I mentioned earlier, the process of establish, establishing the Israeli uh, structure or infrastructure to mitigate cyber threats, um, on that way, the government took some decisions, two resolutions that were taken earlier this year uh, that were published, which that outlined quite extensively wh what our aims are and what we are going to do about that. So it's not a strategy, but it's, uh, and it's not in Hebrew, it's, it's in Hebrew, but it's in English as well, I, there's an English version, uh, with the aim of clarifying to the international community where we are going and why we're doing that. And the, there are two resolutions. One is to set up the organization that will, uh, in effect, uh, implement the uh, national policy, which is the National Cybersecurity Authority. And the other one is aimed at the internal um, system, and that is to regulate and standardize uh, cyber, cyber security, cyber security expertise. So, and, and, and the aim of that resolution is to pull Israelis' organization uh, to follow the government's example. So it's leading by example. And so it puts a very clear line where we are going, what we are exactly doing. And I suppose that at time, in, in time when we feel it's really necessary, we'll come up with a more broad uh, idea, uh, which leads me to the other question that you asked, what are the gaps? And I think for the first time in cyber, Israel is realizing that, uh, that our security also depends on international cooperation. So in the past, uh, we maintain our security in a very clear way. We are independent. We have to be able to protect ourselves. It's a basic tenant in Israel's security. Uh, but in cyber, of course, we all realize that you have to work with, uh, with others, with other players, with like-minded countries, with allies. And so perhaps in that respect, also, it's important to come up with some papers that hooks up to the developments in the world. And so uh, I would assume that sooner than later, uh, some paper like that would come out. Thank you. In the back. Yes, go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Fred Sai from uh, Salesforce.com. Quick question about China's role in the, this emerging uh, global governance of the internet. Um, has China been helpful? We, we've heard a lot about, you know, the, today about, you know, again, uh, bilateral uh, uh, understandings between China and the U.S., China and the U.K. Um, we also hear about a lot of the. Um, the uh, negative uh, attacks coming from China um, from unknown actors. But um, has China been helpful in, in terms of global governance? I'd like to take that up. Well, um, just uh, I, I don't want to, uh, uh, maybe I should uh, ask the views of the others, but uh, I just want to uh, sort of uh, introduce to you this kind of discussion that we had uh, in the context of a trilateral cyber dialogue that we had with China and South Korea. And uh, of course, China had a very, very much interest in the, the democratic governance of the internet world. And uh, it, uh, it, the re interpretation of that uh, is probably uh, understandable. But uh, they are, they, although they are supportive of the uh, multi-stakeholder approach, they have a, a slightly or even uh, substantive uh, uh, emphasis on greater role of the government uh, in comparison to the private sector. And they're talking about uh, what they call uh, democratic governance of the internet. Uh, and uh, so, and it is up to <coughs> the, each factor, each, each stakeholders in the cyberspace, uh, whether you consider it to be the, the good standard or, or, or not. So, so I, I, just, I just stop here. I, I don't want to make my own uh, 
uh, comment on appreciation on this, but uh, this, this is uh, what the Chinese, uh, Chinese government's orientation is as far as the internet governance is concerned. So. Does anybody want to add to that? No. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Alan Rawl, Sidley, Austin. There was a comment from the panel about uh, tying cybersecurity perhaps to international trade agreements, if I heard that correctly. How would that work? There's been talk recently in connection with the European Union's restriction of data flows to the United States as to whether this is a violation of uh, you know, national treatment and non-discrimination provisions and WTO agreements. D what, how would you envision that might work with cybersecurity? Uh, is it, does it concern uh, in, uh, intellectual property infringement or national treatment issues? Could you elaborate on that? Thank you. Look, at what, what, I, <clears throat> what I see is that um, um, there is a lot of talk. The dialogue is, is uh, a, a very active, but we have to move to action. And we have to push uh, governments, and I'm talking about Latin America, to move in that direction, to I implement uh, uh, cybersecurity policies to join uh, those recommendations. And the recommendations are not enough. And we've been talking for many, many years, and nothing is happening. And I don't see any priority on, on most of the governments in Latin America to move. So we have to come up with new ways to move them. Uh, to, and I completely agree with you. In, in, in the few uh, elements of the current agreements related to technology, there is huge problems. Look at the IP issues. It is huge. In Colombia, it is huge. We haven't even able to implement the agreement with the United States because the civil society you know, shows up because we, we try to do the the, 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 to pass the law in the Congress, and we couldn't because the protests was, were huge. But, but that, that's just the IP. So I, agree, I fully agree that implementing that is tough. Look at what happened in, in Europe again also. But, uh, but we have to come up with some other ways to, to push countries to move in that direction because uh, you know, we, we need most countries, not every, uh, because you know, thinking of having everybody join is very difficult, but, but at least having their allies join. Right. You know, I, I mean, just to, three weeks from now is the, the Paris Summit on Climate. 20 years of work, um, of just enormous amounts of talk and research and policy making and meeting. Um, uh, in which time global carbon emissions have risen 65%. Um, so there will be aspects of Paris that will be a big success. Um, governments making individual pledges to cut by certain amounts by certain dates, although those are intended and not legally binding. But overall, this process has been a tremendous failure. And the, a, at least a big reason, if not the big reason, is the free rider problem, right? Um, uh, for most countries, it, it, it's a no-brainer to let others cut emissions and free ride on the global benefits of that. And surely, this is the same problem. And, and at least, I think, the the new thinking in this area is in the national action protected by um, border adjustments and you know tariffs is the only way that you can that you'll never be able to negotiate 200 countries by consensus into an agreement but you could act in this other way so i think it's um, it's actually uh, an interesting parallel there over here, yeah. Thanks. Uh, Steve Flynn at Northeastern University. It's understandable that we focused heavily on information technology and intellectual capital and IT, telecommunications and all that, uh, trying to get that coordinated. But the cyber physical threat is also something that's truly international because we share so much infrastructure, whether that's seaports and ports or power grid pipelines and so forth, and to what extent nationally as well as on the international side is a cyber-physical threat 
being addressed as a part of uh, our efforts. I'd, I'd say there is no difference. Uh, it's very similar. I mean, there is no exclusion of physical versus um, virtual. I think it's even clearer that the threat to existing to infrastructures is uh, cause for the international community to come together to reach some agreement. So uh, actually, this is one of the key drivers, uh, especially specifically uh, critical infrastructure, <laughs> utility, utilities and the such for, for international cooperation and agreements. Well, it's the same for us. I mean, the, uh, <coughs> the cyber attack on the critical infrastructure is a priority area for the uh, overall uh, cybersecurity uh, uh, strategy. So uh, we identify uh, uh, certain uh, uh, number of uh, critical infrastructure area for which we have uh, particular attention on um, putting in, putting in new new mechanism for uh, countering uh, measures. Of course, it starts from basic basic uh, uh, information sharing hotline between the central uh, NISC authority and the uh, infrastructure and cooperative information sharing, and as I said, also international cooperation on what we can can be done on that respect. So, so it it is a very uh, important uh, and priority area. But at the same time, maybe, maybe uh, I think the, the, the history of uh, cyber cybersecurity started from more of an economic theft, uh, cyber theft, and cyber crime. So uh, maybe the uh, the, thir the sense of urgency in terms of uh, cybersecurity, national security issue, or uh, uh, attack on uh, critical uh, infrastructure may not be as heightened as it should be. Uh, uh, so, so I think uh, the question of uh, raising the uh, literacy and the awareness of uh, privacy uh, vulnerability is also an important uh, area. Richard, do you want to add something? Uh, I agree with the other panelists. You know, in 2003-2005, there was this World Summit on the Information Society, which essentially was uh, a global dialogue on uh, high-level principles governing the information society. And uh, there was a big debate on uh, cybersecurity on exactly the aspect that you mentioned. you know, In the end, uh, if you look at the document, you'll see you probably won't find the phrase cybersecurity, or maybe you would. But what you'll find is building confidence and security in the use of ICTs, okay? so which is much broader than cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is one layer. If you talk about network security, you know, a variety of other security aspects there. Yes. Yeah, George Law, retired from Department of Commerce. Uh, was doing the uh, export control security issues. And talking about this cybersecurity, uh, this morning the, one of the panel mentioned about uh, bilateral between US and China, or the U, uh, China and the UK, the other country, already is a step forward uh, for Chinese government to at least admitting such kind of problem. And the panel mentioned that is a step forward. And since China has more people uh, use computers and more people have mobile devices than any other country, so if their government uh, participate the uh, international uh, cyber security govern governance, which is a positive move to improve the international cyber security. And this morning session, we understand a lot of problems, but we haven't get into too much solutions. But I like one panel mentioned about a, one of the solution could be uh, put uh, cybersecurity as a condition in trade agreement. I don't know, can you uh, tell us a little bit more specific what kind of things in your mind should be put in the trade agreement? What kind of wording you like to have? You know, uh, there, there, are, there are some issues that, that could be included, especially in terms of uh, cooperation, international cooperation, that's key. In, in terms of uh, uh, law enforcement, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, of course, uh, 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 as we are trying to do with IP, doing uh, a kind of um, coordination of the legal frameworks, because something that it, we, we could... Uh, uh, so what it is happening in some countries in Latin America, and in some countries in Latin America, cyber crime is not a formal crime. So, you know, trying to, to move those countries to uh, a, a more 
common platform in terms of uh, uh, protecting the cyberspace. Anybody else? Um, I, I wanted to um, uh, raise also the question um, about whether the sense I have that uh, um, people are measuring progress by government's willing government's willingness to engage on this issue and to talk um, isn't drastically out of relation to the degree of the threat. Um, I, I, I alluded to this earlier that it can be a very long road between when you sit down to talk and when you reach some kind of, of agreement that actually addresses the mutual vulnerability here. Um, and I, it seems as though all of our discussions, this panel and the earlier one, suggest um, uh, a sense of, of real progress having been made on the willingness to talk. Um, but is that in, in any, bear any relationship to the degree of, of the mutual vulnerability that we, in fact, experience? I would say, if I may, um, there is there is a distinction to be made between willing political willingness and and technological preparedness of governments to to communicate. So uh, many countries still have to get their act together, and most of the countries around the world are still doing that. And once they feel that they are already sort of less more or less organized, that's when they say, okay, now let's tap into the global discussion and and try to find out how we can enhance our security via international cooperation. So in that respect, it's a sort of a inward, outward process that needs to take place. Countries have to understand what are their vulnerabilities, and so they have to be able to, to gauge what kind of cooperation they would need in order to enhance that security. I think that's the most important problem. Politically, everybody's prepared to talk because everybody understands that it's necessary to find common solutions. Um, you can see that in a GGE, everybody, every country has been contributing and being very active and, and, and in, initiating different ideas. So there's no lack of political preparedness, but it's an issue of how do you connect uh, the different um, strategies and environments and try to build up something global. And that's, that's a complicated part. And in that respect, the GGE's report was very important because that sets a common ground to everybody, international law applies, so we can move on from there. Yes. Hi, I'm Michelle Markoff. Um, I've been the U.S. negotiator uh, on the GGE and um, in charge of these issues since 1998, and um, I'm Chris Painter's deputy. I thought I would offer perhaps uh, a minute on the U.S. view of the value of the GGE, taking off what Ito had said. Um, the countries that are coming together in the GGE are coming together out of a common interest in preventing conflict, state-on-state -state conflict in cyberspace. What has been so useful about the GGE is that we turned it from an early conversation in 2005 uh, from arms control proposals to ban the development, deployment, and use by states of what the Russians called information weapons to a discussion about what are the standards of responsible behavior by states in cyberspace. It is a conversation that's been going on now for 10 years. Um, we have made progress, as Ito says. We have affirmation by the uh, states that are participating that um, international law applies, which has uh, extensive ramifications in terms of restraining state activity offensively against other nations. And in this last GGE, which ended in June, uh, we also came up with 11 voluntary, non-legally binding norms uh, that states should begin to uh, adhere to uh, in order to prevent uh, conflict. These included, I think, I'm sure Chris said it, I wasn't here then, uh, not attacking critical infrastructures, not attacking certs, 
uh, being willing to work with victims, victim states of attacks that appear to be emanating from your territory, whether or not they're state-sponsored or uh, third-party sponsored. So uh, the reason why this is such a popular activity now is we have made progress. Unlike uh, other GGEs, it has become the bellwether for um, state agreement here, but a GGE is just the recommendations of uh, governmentally appointed experts. It is not binding. So the notion that there should be enforcement is premature. We are trying to come up, I wouldn't call it a regime, but a framework uh, of with two pillars, norms of expected responsible behavior by states, confidence building measures which allow states to cooperate in real time to prevent uh, conflict or crises from getting out of hand. That eventually is developing into issues of how does one maintain stability, international stability in cyberspace? And that would be through restraint, which these norms that Chris talked about, peacetime norms, uh, really represent. They're issues of restraint in the interests of stability. So whether or not we end up in five years or 10 years with a, a, a treaty document, I think it's premature to say. I think we have to educate the international community. We have to continue to arrive at uh, uh, further conversations about what other norms ought to apply in cyberspace. Thank you, that was helpful. If there are any last questions? If not, please join me thanking the panel and we have... <laughs>